completely free. With affordable financing plans, Sonobello fits almost any budget. Call for your free no-obligation consultation today and find out how to get one area free. Call 855-417-8920. Now, Papa John's, better ingredients, better pizza. Order online at papajohns.com. If you see news happening, send it to us at cbs4pix at cbs.com. Now, from CBS4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Lauren Pastrana in for Jim DeFeedy and welcome to Facing South Florida. This week, the U.S. State Department issued a level four travel advisory for Haiti. Level four means do not travel there. Widespread civil unrest and violent demonstrations prompted the closure of the U.S. Embassy there. The U.S. government authorized the voluntary departure of non-emergency personnel and their families and limited services to U.S. citizens remaining in the country. It has since reopened the embassy, but the travel advisory level remains elevated. Joining me now is Jacqueline Charles, the Miami Herald's Caribbean Haiti reporter. Jacqueline, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. I'm sure you've been very busy following the latest <laughs> developments. And, and this weekend, we are filming this on Friday, but this weekend expected to be another possibly busy weekend in Haiti. At the root of the protests that we've been seeing in the recent weeks is the Haitian government's plan to raise the fuel prices there. We're talking by as much as 50%. Why such a steep hike? Well, you know, for years, Haiti has basically kept their fuel prices is artificially low. And right now the country is running a huge deficit, about $150 million, which is the, about the amount that it loses by keeping these fuel prices low. So the international community, including the United States, the World Bank, and others have said, listen, if you want us to help you, you need to collect the money that you're giving away, and you have to start with the fuel. Now, what has come up is the way in which they, they did it. This is a country where we have double-digit inflation, slow growth, huge unemployment, employment. Things just have not been great for this country, especially since the 2010 earthquake. It has not recovered. And so the population says, listen, this is too much for us. We are already dealing with a lot of economic struggles. And now on top of it, you want to raise this fuel price. And just to give you an idea, um, the price of kerosene, for instance, which a lot of poor people use, went up by 51 percent. Gasoline went up by 38 percent. What does that mean? It means that for a mother who works as a domestic um, in a house or as a domestic worker, for instance, at a hotel, as a maid, her daily wage is about $4.39 a day for eight hours of work. If she has two children and she has to send them to school, and she lives, say, in Petronville, which is just above the hills in Port-au-Prince, and they just have to take one bus to come back, that trip costs almost half of her daily salary. So this is the response that the population is giving. I know that there's been a lot of speculation about what was behind it, but there's been a deep, um, what I call a malaise, just the, the frustration of the inequality over the haves versus the have-nots and feeling people who are at the bottom just feeling like there's just no way that they can rise. There's just no way that they can make a living in this country. So when you talk about the fuel prices, which is a very touchy and explosive mm -hmm. issue in any country, yes. there you saw the reaction. And talk about that reaction. What were people doing and seeing in the streets originally when the unrest first broke out and what is it like there right now? Well, it's interesting. You know, this uh, the announcement was made during the World Cup, the mm -hmm. Brazil-Belgium game, and Haitians are huge Brazilian fans. So the game was going on and that's when I first got the word. And words traveled very quickly. Within five minutes of Brazil losing the World Cup, barricades started going up. And when I say barricade, I mean burning tires, trees, uh, sand, whatever they, they could find. And it wasn't just in Port-au-Prince, but in regions around the country. They were just blocking roads. And I had a number of people who I was talking to who was literally trapped in that situation. And when they would go to try to pass, the young men, it was mostly young men, they would say, listen, they just raised the gas prices. That's not good for me. That's not good for you. So I'm sorry, but we can't let you pass. So people literally got trapped in their homes and their businesses outside of their homes, some for as many as three days. And then what happened Saturday morning, the prime minister about 7 a.m., he gives an address to the nation. He doesn't reverse the decision, but he basically explains it. And then he talks about what the government has been doing, but he makes no mention in terms of what we're going to do about jobs, what we're going to do about putting food in people's stomach. And people reacted very angrily to that. And then we saw 
it got really violent. And then this is when the rioting started, the looting started, um, and there were a number of businesses that were looted. Um, one luxury hotel, there were seven cars that were set on fire outside. Uh, the hotels were fine, but it was just people expressing, you know, their anger. Uh, there was a supermarket chain. Uh, three of their stores were also looted. You and know, I hear those employees lost their jobs. 673 just from that one supermarket chain, you know. And so people have said, I can understand why are you, you know, sort of turning on yourself. And some people make the argument, well, the people, these, they can't go into these supermarkets anyway. They can't afford that, mm -hmm. you know, that stuff. It doesn't justify the violence. Um, and the private sector, which is very angry about what has happened because they've now lost a lot. They don't have the insurance to cover it. But they recognize that what happened here was a result of the frustration and the sheer despair of this population. And those are issues that need to be addressed. And the U.S. government issuing that travel warning, the State Department saying do not travel there. The most elevated, the level yeah. four saying not to travel there. So we know what the people there are dealing with, but what does this mean for the people here in the United States who wish to travel there, the people, American citizens who were in Haiti? We have a large Haitian American population here in South Florida who I imagine want to reach their family at this point. Well, I have to tell you, this is a big travel season for Haiti. This is when a lot of Haitian Americans, especially, they go back to Haiti because we have all of these hometown festivals in all of these cities, and this is when they get a lot of revenue coming in. So it's very unfortunate that this happened when it did, because it is going to impact the travel, not just from Haitian Americans, but a number of people who go and work with charities, because it was a very scary situation. Imagine you're driving down the street, you know, you're either going to the beach that Friday, or you're going to visit a friend, or you're going to your hotel from the airport, and all of a sudden, flaming barricades, tires are, tires are up, and you don't know what's going on. I mean, I had a group of family that I interviewed, it was 28 of them, and they were literally stuck at a police station. They had been there for three days, but after three days, they were feeling very sort of, you know, insecure about the situation because it's like all of a sudden everybody knows that we're here and we need to be able to move. They couldn't go back because there were barricades, and eventually the Haitian SWAT came and took them out. So I think that the best thing that people could do right now is just sort of let's just wait and let the situation die down a little bit. I think, you know, over this weekend, we will have a better picture of what's going to happen, whether or not the government government falls or the government stays, um, and then what happens next? I mean, the IMF, the international community, is still insisting that the gas prices, they knew they need to be raised, but what they're saying is that it has to be gradual, and with that, the government needs to put in some social programs. For instance, transportation vouchers for, you know, the example that I gave you about, so that mother doesn't have to spend half of her daily wages on, tr on transport just to get her kids to and from school. You know, public canteens so that people could find a place to get some food because, you know, the money that they would have spent on food, they now have to use it on transportation. So that's what they're saying. that we we need to put in some social measures because at the end of the day, Haiti does need money. The money that was promised by the international community after the earthquake, over $10 billion, that money never really came. People here in South Florida certainly will be keeping a very close eye on the situation in Haiti, especially over this weekend regarding the prime minister, the president, yes. where we go from here. Jack Will and Charles from the Miami Herald, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Thank you for having me. And coming up next on Facing South Florida, the bloom is back. Green, slimy algae once again coating South Florida waterways. An Everglades expert is here to explain why and what it means for the river of grass. Ah, oh, it's so peaceful here. How would you like to?
state of emergency is in effect for parts of Florida affected by yet another round of toxic algae blooms. The guacamole like sludge has once again turned up in waterways on both coasts. And here's how it got there. Heavy rain, like what we've seen recently, dumps into Lake Okeechobee, which is filled with fertilizers and nutrients from farland. To not overtax the old dike around the lake, water is sent west down the Caloosahatchee toward the Gulf and east into the St. Lucie River to Stewart and the Atlantic Ocean. When the sun hits, it the algae blooms. Normally the salt water kills it, but with so much released at one time, the salt water is diluted. Freshwater algae cannot be sustained by the salt water coming in. So if we stop the discharges for a little while, allow those tides to come in and out of the inlet, that brings that salt water in and, and kills back the algae. And that is what the Army Corps of Engineers agreed to do to stop the discharges by closing the floodgates at Port Mayaca at Lake Okeechobee. But that was only temporary. Earlier this week, the White House backed Florida's effort to secure federal funding for a reservoir intended to move water away from Lake Okeechobee and reduce those discharges altogether. The funding request for the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir now heads to the U.S. Senate. And Shannon Estenos is the COO of the Everglades Foundation. Shannon, thank you so much for joining us thank this you morning. For Having you, so explain to our viewers this Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir. It should help alleviate some of what we've been seeing, but how exactly will that work? So the reservoir is located south of Lake Okeechobee, and your animation showed that right now the primary way of getting water out of the lake is either to the east, to the St. Lucie Estuary, or to the west of the Caloosahatchee. We don't have the engineered capacity right now to get a lot of water to the south, even though that's the way water flowed in the natural Everglades. The water didn't flow east and west. It flowed south into the Everglades and down to Florida Bay. So the reservoir, which will be located south of Lake Okeechobee, is an engineering solution to that problem. So it solves really a number of problems at the same time. It helps reduce those flows out to those two estuaries, but it also helps get that lake water moving south again uh, the way it did in under natural conditions. Okay, now it goes to the Senate, yes. whether or not that funding, that all important funding will come through for Florida, but it's gonna take several years to complete no matter what. So what can be done in the meantime? Well, there's not a lot that can be done to stop an algae bloom once it starts. Um, certainly reducing the amount of nutrient pollution in our waterways is is a, a big part of the solution. And um, that's something that Florida needs to work on. The way algae works is it thrives when there is excess nutrient and pollution in, in fresh water. And we sort of have an all you can eat buffet of nutrients um, in water. And when summer comes and the conditions are right, the nutrients are going to take advantage of that excess food, if you will, and uh, and bloom. Okay, so let's blooming. talk about that algae yeah. and that bloom. And it's it's really gross to look at, for lack of a better term. Residents or visitors think it smells bad, it looks bad. But let's talk about the impact. We're talking wildlife, business impacts as well. What are you hearing? Well, um, the impacts are dire. Uh, right now, we're seeing, just to give you an example, we're seeing an algal bloom in the Caloosahatchee River, for example. Let's just take the west side of things. Recent water quality samples that were taken from the Caloosahatchee, uh, the EPA sets a recreational exposure limit um, to this kind of algae of 10. And the samples that have been taken from the Caloosahatchee recently, 1,900. Wow. Wow. 1900. I thought you were going to stop so, at 19, not no. 1900. 1900. And so what that means is that this is in a part of the river where people are boating. People are normally would be fishing. Um, boat ramps are there. And so, uh, you know, it really makes the waterway not usable uh, to folks who want to recreate, you know, on the Caloosahatchee, for example. I've seen the hashtag, and it's got to say it's pretty clever, now or never glades. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about what can be done. Mm -hmm. If nothing is done, let's say, into the future, what are we looking at as far as the river of grass here? Well, um, we're looking at potentially the demise of the river of, of grass. And we've known for a very long time that the economic well-being of this region relies on the sustainability of the Everglades. It's where we get our drinking water. It's the source of fresh water for our fisheries, our coastal fisheries. So many sectors of our economy rely on a healthy Everglades. So there really, there isn't an alternative. If we want a thriving South Florida, we have to have a thriving Everglades. And there's no plan B. Everglades restoration is the cure to the sick Everglades. And, and let me say this, that algae blooms are a symptom of a sick ecosystem. 
Uh, just like if you have a young child and, and they have a fever, a high fever, uh, you know that something is causing that fever. Yes, the fever is the immediate crisis, but the cure is to, is to really cure what's causing the fever, and that's what Everglades restoration is all about. This reservoir is a, one of the most critical components of Everglades restoration. It's really important that we move forward with the restoration pro project if we want the entire region to be sustainable into the future. So obviously, we as residents of the state of Florida are, are concerned about what's going on here. What can people do to make sure that the Senate takes some sort of action? Well, the, the good news is, is that the Trump administration cleared the report this week, as you mentioned, and so it is now on Capitol Hill. It's, it's waiting to be passed in the Water Resources Development Act, and so um, folks who care about this issue um, can take direct action by just using their phone. They can text the word WATER, W-A-T-E-R, to 52886. And that will send a message directly to their legislator and to the Senate to, the Senate to uh, pass the Water Resources Development Act, which now has our reservoir in it. And very quickly before you go, because I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, wait, they close the floodgates and then they reopen them and people might be confused. Why do they need to do this? Explain to our viewers why it has to be done, really. It does. Um, the way that system was engineered decades ago, the east and west escape valves for the lake, they're the only way to get water out of the lake. And um, the Herbert Hoover Dyke, which is built around Lake Okeechobee, um, can only safely hold water at a certain depth. And in order to protect lives and property south downstream from the lake, the Corps of Engineers has to manage those water levels in a safe way. And we're looking at another three months of the wet season. So we, in, in the event we get a hurricane, that lake needs to be able to take the water that, that the, the upstream sends to to it and the, that and that mother nature sends to it so the army corps of engineers really doesn't have an option mm -hmm. um, until we build new infrastructure like this reservoir we're going to continue the corps is going to continue to send that water east and west and you mentioned the strength of the dike uh, mm -hmm. around lake okeechobee and that is a, a major concern That's is your right. organization involved in sort of uh, improving that front as well i'm sure it's a multi-pronged approach it's right. not just the reservoir that needs to be handled that's right so the good news is is that the federal government has fully funded um uh, rehabbing, rehabilitating the Herbert Hoover Dyke, which is aging, and um, as I mentioned, which the Corps of Engineers has a lot of concern about. And that's really important um, to make sure that that dike is safe for the people who live downstream. That reinforcing the dike isn't a solution to the estuary problem, unfortunately, because even when we strengthen that dike, we there's a limit to how much yeah. water you can stack in the lake. It can hold more, but it still needs it, to come it out. It still at needs point. to come out. And frankly, if you hold too much water in the lake, you'll kill the lake. And the lake is an important fishery. Um, the lake is 700 square miles. It's mm -hmm. an enormous body of water. So Everglades restoration really is the answer. Yeah. A very complex issue. Thank you so much for joining us here this morning on Thank Facing you. South Florida. Now, we want to remind you, our viewers, that the toxic algae bloom in 2016 actually sparked a year-long CBS4 investigation. To learn more about the ever-
Welcome back. For almost eight years, Pam Bondi has served as the Attorney General of Florida. Due to term limits, she cannot run again, but she's already thrown her support behind the person she hopes to succeed her. Bondi has endorsed Ashley Moody, a former judge of the 13th Judicial Court Circuit of Florida. Ashley Moody joins us now on Facing South Florida. Thank you so much for being of here course. this morning. Thanks for letting me stop by. No problem. So we mentioned the sitting Attorney General of the state of Florida. In fact, you have quite a bit in common with Pam Bondi as far as both being University of Florida and Stetson graduates, both being assistant state attorneys. You went on to serve on the bench, but Ms. Bondi has said of you, no one will outwork you. So how do you plan to work for the people of Florida? Well, it, she's correct. I have, I have been working hard. In fact, I say now my daily goal is to not fall asleep while I'm standing up. <laughs> it's just been uh, quite the whirlwind on the campaign. But, you know, my background, I actually started off, I have a degree in accounting, a master's of accounting and law degree from the University of Florida, and then a master's of law in international law from Stetson. And I actually started off practicing law as a business uh, defense attorney hmm. uh, with Holland and Knight, one of the, the state's largest law firms, and then was a federal prosecutor. And that was one thing that uh, Attorney General Bam Pam Bondi and I had uh, different in our background. She was a state prosecutor and I was a federal prosecutor. And then I became a state uh, circuit court judge. I was on the bench for over a decade before I, I had to give up my position. I had to resign my position in order to run for the office of Attorney General. So it has been quite the whirlwind of a year, as you can imagine. My husband is a career law enforcement officer, so we are in this together as I seek the role of top cop. He has been extremely supportive. I'm also a mother, and balancing statewide candidacy with motherhood is, is certainly a challenge, but he has made it much easier. So how are you going to use that background, both with how you studied, being a mother, a, a wife, and being married to a law enforcement officer to serve the people of this state? Well, you know, as the top cop, the top prosecutor, uh, it is important that we have someone in that role that has worked alongside law enforcement, understands how to prosecute difficult cases. Uh, personally, I have uh, family involved in that profession, and I understand what a noble and difficult, dangerous profession that is, and I'm extremely supportive and a vocal uh, supporter of law enforcement. The same protective instincts I have as a mother, I will bring to the office as the Attorney General. I'm the only one in this race running that has prosecuted a case running to be the top prosecutor. And it is so important that we have someone in this role that will carry on uh, the good work of Attorney General Bondi, ensuring that we have someone that will enforce the rule of law and defend the Constitution. So let's talk about those specific issues on health care. Specifically, do you support the plan to end protections for consumers with pre existing conditions? You know, that is going to be up to Congress and, and how they, they deal with that issue. The Attorney General is going to be charged with enforcing the rule of law. Uh, certainly, the Attorney General is also charged with the responsibility of ensuring that we as a state and, and our ability to have autonomy and, and declare what is best for our state is protected. And the Attorney General is responsible for that, and I'll be a guardian of that. Uh, on gun control, I understand that you are a supporter of the Second Amendment and believe in the right of the people to keep and bear arms. It's a touchy subject here, specifically in South Florida, following the massacre at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas back in February. And immediately after that, Governor Rick Scott passed a three-day waiting period for the purchase of all firearms and raising the age to buy a gun from 18 to 21. Are these changes that you support? You, you are correct. I am a, a strong supporter that we protect the freedoms and rights ensured in our Constitution. I think it's one of the things that has kept our country so strong uh, for over 200 years that we always go back to protecting the individual rights that are guaranteed to our citizens. Uh, I am a mother of an elementary school student. I along with all parents of children in schools understand that their safety is of paramount importance. Uh, there is a body right now led by Sheriff Gulteri from St. Petersburg who has also endorsed me. I've been endorsed by almost 90 percent of the Republican sheriffs across the state of Florida and uh, the statewide law enforcement organizations. Uh, there is no one that will focus on those recommendations and ensure that they are implemented and ensure that we carry out um, the plans of addressing all of where we fell short and leading up to that tragic incident in Parkland. But specifically I, I those changes, those specifically those changes that the governor made regarding that three-day waiting period and raising the age from 18 to 21, is that something that you are comfortable with keeping in effect or, or is that something that you would have supported as no, if you had been attorney general what currently? I, what I, there, was, there was parts of that legislation that, that was good. In fact, they were trying to make changes to how we'd get guns out of the hands of those that are going to do harm to others. Um, there was 
addressing how we can make sure that our schools are shored up and safe. Uh, and, and I do support the, that part of the legislation. I think it was a mistake to blanketly ban firearms uh, for 18 to 21 year olds. The hard work is going to become how do we look at what went wrong, how how do we take the recommendations and implement them in our schools? And you've got to have strong leadership to do that. Historically, over the course of my career, I have set out objective to, objectives to ensure our process, our judicial system is fair, that it is improved, that our uh, processes are uh, efficient, that we're not wasting taxpayer money. I will do that in the course of making sure that we implement the recommendations and protections to our school and I will do that as a strong attorney general, a strong top cop in Florida. A major issue in the state of Florida right now as we're winding down here, not been spared here by the opioid epidemic. The current attorney general is saying 15 Floridians die a day because of opioids. You say that you would take a data-based attack on the opioid epidemic. What would that look like? Well, what we need to do is have a coordinated statewide effort where we look at what is effective and, and the ways that we've been trying to attack this. And we've done different things in different communities throughout Florida, but I can tell you, as a former federal drug prosecutor, as the wife of a DEA agent, uh, there is no one better prepared to lead this effort and passionate about this effort. I am convinced that if we can bring together the experts in this area, the, peop the sheriffs that have already tried things throughout the state, the community leaders that are specializing in addiction uh, across the state, that we can uh, develop a plan to direct our resources mm -hmm. and our efforts to a way to bring this number down. I'm a numbers person. I was trained in accounting. I can assure you at the end of four years, uh, the people of the state of Florida will see progress and I will make a difference in the opioid epidemic. Ashley Moody, candidate for Attorney General, thank you so much for joining us thank this morning. Thank you for having me. We'll be right back after this break. You can follow me on Twitter at Lauren Pastrana or email me at lpastrana at cbs.com. Remember to join us next week on Facing South Florida. I'm Lauren Pastrana. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. If you see news